Hi, very good morning to you. Welcome along to Pancake Tuesday mornings, OTB AM. Uh, we're here with you all the way until about half past nine this morning. And one of the great things of um, Irish culinary history is also going to happen today. Owen's going to try a Krispy Kreme for the first time. Is that going to happen today? I think so, yeah. My body's a temple, so I'm prepared to chip away at that temple all day long today. I have many multiples, just to make sure that it, the first one... I think it's kind of a pointless exercise to try one Krispy Kreme. You should have heard. enough to make you sick. Exactly, and it's only then, at that point of sickness and when the nausea sets in, that you really know if Krispy Kremes are delicious or not. Yeah, if they're for you. Yeah, I presume they, they probably will be at that point where it's like, God, I feel like I'm going to die, but I feel so heavenly at the same time because they taste so good. That, that's the point I want to reach. Yeah, okay, well, uh, we'll talk more. We'll explain that bit to you a little bit later on. You were out hanging out with uh, one of the Dublin footballers yesterday. Um, Brian Howard was doing some media, but it's um, Philly who's made all the papers this morning. Yeah, Philly saying that we should uh, shut up and put up and uh, get on with uh, what the situation currently is with regards to Dublin, with regards to the Super 8s, with regards to venues, and with regards to, I guess, stopping the, the greatest team in the country at the moment. Does he mean don't, don't speak? Just everybody stop talking? Is that what he means? I, he, he doesn't say that, to be fair. He, he just talks about the idea that you know, pe people have been pushing for rule changes or a uh, change to the status quo in terms of actually targeting Dublin in terms of actually trying to stop this thing for, for moving on. Uh, and he thinks that, I, 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 from what I can ga gauge from these quotes, he thinks that everything is really fair at the moment. Like, I, I do wonder if Philly McMahon is actually just speaking for Dublin here, or if there are players from other counties who actually kind of agree with him. That he, he alludes to the notion that it wouldn't be the same to beat Dublin under different circumstances than the current setup. And mm. I, I do wonder if there was actually current players from certain counties who actually think to themselves, yeah, it wouldn't be the same. It would, like, the idea that they're being treated a little more fairly would just make it all the sweeter if we ended up beating them. Okay. I know, that doesn't make any sense, no, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Like you, you saw on League Sunday the week before last, Tommaso Shea and Colin were work both saying, oh, sure, I've never moved to Crokes, uh, uh, the Dubs out of Croke Park. We, we love beating them there, and I think that sort of old-school attitude actually prevails in a couple of counties, not all of them, but a couple of counties. And a generation that uh, it was possible to beat Dublin. Well, Croke that's Park, the key point. The current generation where it's impossible. That's, that's the key point as well. So, um, it, like, he, he's kind of come out uh, against people who are, are saying that things need to change. Like, it, the Super 8 motion to remove Dublin from Croke Park was worded in such a way that Dublin were never mentioned in it, but everybody's kind of taken it as a, a targeting of Dublin. And uh, is, is it, are you targeting somebody if you're asking for fairness? Is no. the question here. No, no, no. It's, uh, it is going to be a blot on the copybook of the GAA as long as this competition runs the way it, it does that Dublin are going to have two home games and an unfair advantage. Philly knows that. Everybody, everybody knows that. The players know that too. Yeah, he's talking about rules as well. He says that let's just play Aussie rules in 10 years' time. I when think he's right. I think he's definitely right about this bit. Like, when does it get to the point where we just leave our sport the way it is and play with it? The defensive mark, the offensive mark, or the kick-out mark and the offensive mark, it's like, it's just going to be Aussie rules. Yeah. Like What's the, the difference? The, the, the kick-out mark has definitely improved the game. Um, the offensive mark... I think has had positives and negatives. Like I, I'm all for a rule change as long as it leads to to a positive end result. Even if the motive behind it is to, I don't know, get away from what football has become, or maybe even if the incentive is actually I don't know to stop Dublin. I don't think that it has ever been the incentive. But even if the intention isn't in the right place, as long as the end result is, I don't have any issue with that. And if it, if it does make it a, a more interesting spectacle, then I'm all for it. And I think the offensive mark has shown signs of being a positive thing. Like it does. In some cases, slow the game down a little bit. Referees haven't really been applying whatever the amount of seconds you, you, you need to, to take the mark within. They haven't really been applying that. But um, I don't know. Like, is, is there going to be more, more rule changes, basically, is, is the question? Well, so there be. was that. The, everybody lost their shit over that um, under 14, under 16 game, which finished 2 1 at the weekend. Um, like, this is going to happen in, in sport. There will be matches that are. Uh, ultra defensive, particularly at underage, because the skills of the game are hard to learn, and people don't have enough time to um, to teach the skills again and again and again and again for everybody. Like, it, but if you change that's the rules, that's to do with the under 15s game. Well, if you're going to change the rules every time that something like this happens or overreact to it, then you will always have rule changes, and it is t trending towards Aussie rules. Like, and we're not even taking the good parts of Aussie rules, which 
Um, Kerry Donnelly is always talking about the moving the ball forward 50 yards or moving it into a scoring free whenever there's time wasting or a foul. Like, God, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure if um, that under 15s situation at the weekend is, is like. I don't think you can equate that to not having time to teach kids skills. Well, I just think that like I think it's a vastly different situation. I think it's uh, an extremely negative coach who doesn't believe in that. So the team who was soloing the ball or forward and back. Why didn't they just go forward? Yeah, well, that, exactly. So it's like one team was the only one who was negative, but actually it wasn't. It takes it takes the other team being dumb and not being able to use it or even lump it in and see what happens. And like that's not one coach being negative. That's two coaches. Yeah. But like, like is only, that not is that not the issue? But they're talking about changing the rules because one team can't doesn't have the gumption to solo the ball in and and lay it off. I'm not sure. Like I'm not sure who's been speaking about changing the rules on the back of. Everybody's what, what been talking about changing the rules on the back of de- ultra defensive performances, and that's just another in a long line of ultra defensive performances well, going all I, the way back to Donegal against Dublin that time. I think you're blaming the wrong people here. It's definitely coaches, isn't it? I think we might be talking about the same thing here. The, pro- the people to blame here are not the rules, but the, the coaches who are sending the kids out to play in such a way, or to tell the team who are coming up against. I don't even want to call it a blanket because it's disrespectful to blankets that uh, they don't want to actually try and penetrate this thing or try and actually uh, take a risk or two. But uh, I, I don't know. I thought that was an, <laughs> like an absolutely disgraceful show of I, I don't even know it's what not, to call it's, it. It's not. It's not. It, it really it's is. Massive, it really massive is. It's under, it's two under fifty. It's not an, a massive oh, overreaction. Christ, this it, is. Uh, you're this calling is, under fifteen is disgraceful. Uh, no, I'm not. I literally said it was the coaches. I literally just said that. It's to do with the coaching of the teams here. They've been set out. Do you really think that the, the, the kids are in that dressing room is like, lads, now uh, we must go out and just pass the ball along in lateral uh, directions and uh, ignore what our coaches are saying? They're being sent out by an adult. I'm not blaming the kids here. I'm blaming the adult coach who sent the 215 teams out to play in a certain way. Now, if your reaction to that is we need to change the rules, well, I think you're ignoring the initial point here, which is that the coaches have sent them out to play in that way. Now, can the rules arrest that? I don't know what the rule is. There's people talking about how you can only keep a certain amount of people inside your own... 21 or, or 45 or whatever it may be I'm not sure what that would actually fix uh, We'll come back to this a little bit later on I think you end up with Nepal uh, which we'll talk about later on in the show believe it or not uh, John O'Shea is an ambassador for the under 17 UEFA European Championships and he's across a lot of this morning's newspapers he spoke with uh, Stephen yesterday about what it's like to be in Irish camps with England's Declan Rice because I think because it took so long I think everyone was kind of leaning a bit towards yeah he was not going to um, not going to declare for Ireland, but it's it's unfortunate. The disappointing aspect is just how he had spoken about how he enjoyed it, and from the games as well that he took part in. Um, that's that's just a dis- the disappointing aspect. We have to move on from it now. He's made his decision to to choose England, and we have to focus on the players that want to play for Ireland. Did he give any any indication in the dressing room, like when you were kind of? Chatting to around like that, did he say kind of stuff like, "Oh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be playing for Ireland. This is this is what I wanted the, to do." Yeah, that's what I mean. That's that. that uh, I think everyone would have felt that that he'd settled in really well around the camp as well, and settled in and the type of personality he was. It looked as if he was going to be uh, an, an Irish international for years to come. But unfortunately, as I said, that's the disappointing aspect for me. How he had spoken about different things and the pride, etc., and that's that's gone now. Coming up, we've got uh, Tracy Neville, uh, sister to Gary and Phil, coming in at 8.50, and a renowned netball coach in her own right. Um, she's here for a coaching conference today, so she's going to join us in the studio around about 9 o'clock this morning. Sports News from 8.45 with Darren, um, at Brian Howard, you've been talking to him. Yeah, he's good for him. Yesterday I did it for uh, an AIB event, talking about you know Rahini and Kieran Whelan and Brian Fenton. Not a bad old crop of high fielders they have there. Yeah. So we get into the... It, it, can, can one place just take all the high fielders in the country and just leave none for the rest? Are we going to see a lot of um, lads coming out of retirement who are good high fielders who now will have a future as a full forward? You know, if you can jump and catch the ball four times in an hour mm. and score four points off it, that's it's not a bad return from your inside forward. No, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. The in thing a game is, they can finish 12-10. Yeah. Uh, like the, the thing is, it's kind of pointless now, isn't it? We're more than halfway through the league. So that route is being turfed out. But it's going to come in next year. Yep. That's what I mean, when it comes in. It should come in next year. Well, should it? I, don't know, I, think, I, I think on the balance of things, it's been a good addition. I think that if they police more uh, stringently how long it actually takes for somebody to take a mark, you get closer to the positives of it all. 
you are favouring the offensive player in that position. It's so frustrating to see somebody catch a ball inside and then they're uh, swallowed up by five defenders. And because the, the referee will then inevitably give... But isn't lumping the ball into the, the big lad in the full forward line really one of the most rudimentary tactics and so therefore aren't you levelling the playing field for the crap teams just because teams it's a rudimentary tactic aren't you levelling the playing field for the crap teams who haven't bothered to evolve a playing style or develop a skill set so lump ball into big man is the type of thing that any division 4 team in any county can do if they have a big man and somebody can kick the ball 40 yards which let's face it most small clubs in the country have you're now going okay we've like put a decade into coaching our players to be able to you know, move and and run in certain areas and, and sprint and kick pass across the field and move together in pretty patterns. No, nah, don't need any of that. You need big men, you need two big men in the full forward line who he's going to lump all in all day. Happy days. That was fair. That was good. Yeah, I'd well say done in developing new tactics, guys. I'd, I disagree with pretty much everything you said there. Uh, namely, like, first of all, what team got promoted from Division 4 last year? One of uh, the people... Somebody who got hammered for you know these new wave tactics in Carlo, so they've certainly been working on that to say that Division Four teams prefer kind of more simplistic tactics. They got promoted, so they're obviously one of the progressive teams. Yeah, well, saying, every Division Four relatively. club in the country, every club in the country has a big man that they, they can lorry ball into. You're now leveling the playing field. I'd love. I don't have the statistics to hand, but I would love to see the amount of offensive marks that have actually been caught by a big man over his head in, say, Kieran Donaghy style 2006. That is not how this offensive mark has been working. This offensive mark has been working quite a lot with ball into the chest. You look at Kerry Dublin a couple of weeks ago, every single time they went route one, how many offensive marks did they get off the big high ball? Zero. The ball broke every single time and it was still offensive. People can still go route one even without the offensive mark. Tactics are not going to be influenced that much by it. Also, the, the fact that you say it's a rudimentary tactic doesn't mean that it doesn't require pretty good execution. It does. The, the kick needs to be pinpoint, the catch needs to be good, and it probably also requires you to be in a one-on-one -on -one position so that the defender doesn't break it. The option is still there for the defender to break it. My problem is, when that, in your words, rudimentary tactic is executed, and executed well, there is no reward for it, because suddenly you've got four people around you, you get crowded out, and the referee gives a travelling foul against you. So, you say bring it in. I think on the balance of things, it's been a positive, yes. All right. Um, we'll bring you some more um, John O'Shea in a minute. Let's bring you to the newspapers this morning. We're going to start with the Times Ireland edition. And it's uh, a picture of Jack Charlton looking uh, pretty well. Um, Jack Charlton and insets his brother, Sir Bobby, Sir Jeff Hurst and Roger Hunt attended the funeral of the World Cup winning goalkeeper in Staffordshire yesterday. Former teammates turned out for Banks. It's a long time since Gordon Banks died for the funeral. As, they, as we've always mentioned in England, the funerals are like weeks and weeks after someone dies. It's crazy. Mm. What the hell is wrong with England? Well, what, what is the thought process behind it? I know I'm putting you on the spot there. I, I, uh, I don't, I've is never it a religious thing? No, I don't think, no, it's like... Loads of funeral masses before... I think it might be like capacity. Right. Um, it might be a capacity issue generally. That's what I've heard before, but like that doesn't make any sense either. It's like, speed things up there. Um, fans won't force Bale out of uh, rail. So Real Madrid and Gareth Bale and Gareth Bale's agent have all been briefing against each other. Gareth Bale's agent has criticised Real Madrid's disgraceful fans and told them they will not force the Wales forward out of the club. He's also given another interview in the uh, tabloids where he's talking about how much money Bale earns and how expensive it might be for anybody who uh, wanted to sign him. He, he gets 350 grand per week after tax. That's not bad. It's not bad at all, is it? And uh, Kenny, no project players. Uh, Ireland under-21 manager says that he's against bringing rugby's residency rule into football. Stephen Kenny... The Ireland under-21 manager is due to graduate in the senior post next year is totally against naturalisation spreading from rugby into football. The IRFU has capped eight players born abroad at senior level after they had earned Irish citizenship by living in the country for five years. Although the rules in football are more complicated, uh, Stephen Kenny is against it. I, would be in favor of the resident I wouldn't be in favour of the residency rule being expanded into football. My personal view is that somebody couldn't live here for five years and play for us. That's not the true essence of international football. I don't necessarily agree with that. I've got to say, I mean somebody comes to live in a country, are we, are we anti-immigrants? Like, people can't move and live in another country and become part of that country? Is that what we're saying? Is this like, point that people... Will people be go all around the world and have done for like a thousand years? Is this point that people have moved to the country with the express notion of actually playing football for Ireland? 
Uh, no shortage of advice for Brunel as he juggles his options again as the lead on the Irish Times on their Sports Tuesday. And then Ireland need feel-good factor and form for the World Cup. Um, yeah, I mean, we do definitely need um, form. I think that's almost more important. We need a plan. To, like, what happens when teams understand how to shut us down? What do we do then? What's our plan then? Because everybody seems to understand how to... They've done a bit of video work on us, it turns out. Uh, Howard's way forward makes peers of his role models. Uh, last year, the Rohini footballer won an all-star with clubmate Fenton, but there's more to be done. Um, so that's the um, Brian Howard. Is Brian Howard has got a chance to be football the year. Do that good. This year, it's... Yeah, I, he probably does. It depends. Like, we just don't know how many minutes he's going to get. It's a very, very strange thing to say about anybody who's just coming off the back of an all-star year. But there is no guarantee of any places in that Dublin team except for Cluxton, Fenton, Kieran Kilkenny, Jack McCaffrey. I think Howard's getting close to it. Probably is. He's probably in that next rung. Conor Callan, he's a guaranteed starter. Probably coming Dean Rock is a guaranteed starter. Like, I'm not sure if Conor Callan is a guaranteed starter. I, I would say Paul Mannion is probably a tad closer. O'Callaghan has started the year quite well. But it's, it's so strange that you can talk about any All-Star as a maybe when it comes to a starting 15 player, but that's just the, the depth of which Dublin operate. Uh, the Daily Telegraph, uh, United and took a war for 100 million teenager. Old Trafford Club and PSG battled to make Jaden Sancho the most expensive English footballer in history. Um, so Dortmund got him for 7 million, and they're going to sell him for 100 million a year later. That's good business. Yeah, it's not bad. Even, even uh, the good old selling days to, to Bayern Munich, probably still ongoing. But even uh, in the peak of that a couple of years ago, the likes of Lewandowski and all that sort of thing, wouldn't even reach those heights. Benny did you is um, Ruby Walsh's nap of his rides for the week, uh, around about 5-2 to two for Ruby Walsh to be the uh, leading jockey at the Chatham Festival for the 12th time. And JP McManus, the kick of backing a winner has never faded and remains one of the greatest feelings. There is still nothing like it. Um, obviously, gamble responsibly. And the... Uh, Indo this morning. Philly, stop complaining and just try and beat the dubs. Shut up, basically. Shut up and stop fixing the rules. Stop changing things just to beat us. Come on, beat us. Come on. He says with his hand broken in um, um, training, apparently. So he'll be out for a little while. And United and PSG battle to sign 100 million Sancho. Um, and also Kieran Marmion looks set to return to the honor squad for this week. That's it. I've got the uh, Irish Examiner PDF for you this morning. Or do we? We do. Blocking out the noise, Philip McMahon challenges Dublin's rivals to become contenders. Uh, babyface assassin, there's more to Solskjaer than Mr. Nice Guy, says John O'Shea. No levy, Tracy Kennedy signals clubs won't have to contribute to park costs. Um, Gail Fika reveals the French mindset for the Ireland clash. And a different perspective, medals can't be the only measure of indoor athletic success, which is true. Back page of the Herald this morning leads with Ole can do it. O'Shea says Red's able to pull off PSG mission and the uh, photograph on the back here is what a difference a week makes. That's Sharon Rovers' Aaron Green sent off last Monday against Bowles, celebrates his goal in last night's 3-0 Premier Division win over Finn Harps at Tallis Stadium. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Star this morning leads with the Alexis Sanchez news. Crocked, says the headline. Sanchez's United career in tatters as Chileans ruled out for the rest of the season. Back page of the Mirror then goes with Gareth Bale. Kiss Chase, bail agent fuming over treatment. It's nothing short of a disgrace. They should be kissing his feet. That's what he says of the Real Madrid fans who jeered him when he was taken off after 61 minutes in El Clasico on Saturday. The Sun then, out of your league. It's uh, the Gareth Bale story again. His agent saying no Premier League club could afford 650,000 a week Real star Gareth. And it's the same story leading the way on the back page of the Irish Daily Mail. Bale's Real crisis. Agent hits out at fans as they turn on Gareth. And Hurling League final set for the end of the month, says Michal Clifford here. They're going to postpone the Allianz Hurling League final by just a week, ensuring that the month of April will be ring-fenced exclusively for club fixtures. And then finally this morning, it's the Guardian, and it's fixture fury. Pochettino hits out at massive disadvantage for Tottenham. And uh, football says goodbye to a legend there. That's the main picture, as you can see from Stoke yesterday. Jack and Sir Bobby Charlton among the mourners as thousands of football fans, families and school children line the streets of Stoke to pay tribute to Gordon Banks. All right, let's move on. Manchester United in uh, action tonight in Paris in the Champions League. The other game um, is Porto against Roma. And, uh, yeah, Daniel Harris is with us. We'll talk about that game in a couple of minutes' time. But, Daniel, we wanted to talk to you uh, before that about an issue that you've been tweeting about. Last week, Spurs issued a statement um, defending 
the use of the Y word by Spurs supporters. Um, you've been writing about this for a couple of years now, and obviously um, it's something that you have a fairly strong viewpoint on. Maybe just before we actually get into um, your own view of it, could you just explain for anybody who's coming late to the story why Spurs are defensive and why Spurs are actually coming out at the moment to defend their supporters? Well, what happened was in the 70s and 80s, supporters, I think primarily of other London clubs, Chelsea, West Ham in particular, I think, but also Arsenal, would refer to Spurs supporters with the Y word, as I guess we have to call it, with um, as a, use a racial epithet to describe them because Spurs were considered to have a lot of Jewish supporters. Um, and what happened was, rather than do nothing, Spurs fans responded by taking the word and responding by calling themselves that word. And the point of doing that, I guess, is to say, well, actually, it's no shame to be identified as this. So we'll ha we're happy to be identified as this. And in the kind of cut and thrust of intra football club, of inter football club banter, I understand why that would happen very quickly because things are done in the in the moment. But now we actually have a bit of time to think about that, and we have a bit of time to think about how we want to talk and where we want our society to be. And it's not all right for. Spurs fans or anyone else to say, well, we've reclaimed that epithet because that epithet is not theirs. It doesn't belong to them and it's not theirs to use and it's not theirs to reclaim. You can't reclaim that which isn't yours. And now we've got a bit of time to think about things. There are a myriad other, a myriad other responses that you can. So if let's say that um, Chelsea fans or, or calling Spurs fans that, then Spurs fans could quite easily return, retort with racist and then pick one of the many expletives available to them and the, the message would be the same without actually using that word and desensitizing people's ears and brains to the use of that word. Now, the reason why they don't do that is because that word now has become part of Spurs supporters' collective identity. And I understand that. I go to football myself. I understand that fans have a particular identity, but I find it hard to understand that Tottenham Hotspur has existed since probably around 1888, I'm guessing, but around then. In that period of time, they've had time to develop a simple yet nuanced identity based on lots of different things that have happened. I refuse to believe that had they never received that racial abuse from whoever else they received it from, that identity would be any different. Because Spurs' identity is not in the gift of Chelsea, West Ham and Arsenal fans. It's about all the incredible things that have happened in the history of, as they like to call it, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Now, um, it's not the same to respond in the way that they do. It's not the same level of offence as it is to do what other clubs do who use that word to talk to them. But again, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't stop. So when Spurs Football Club, the actual football club official body, come along and say, well, actually, it's not really our business. Until there's various other things done by, in all aspects of society, it's absolutely fine. That is the behaviour of the shithouse, effectively. It's saying that it's nothing to do with us. It's a social problem. And, yeah, it is a social problem, but that doesn't mean that it's nothing to do with them, and it also doesn't mean that there's nothing they can do to stop it. I'm not suggesting that everyone who uses that phrase or uses various of those songs get arrested, but... The official position should be, this is not the right thing to do. And if you think about numerous other racial epithets that people might use, and if they were referred to, and if, and if clubs who if clubs who had a lot of fans of a particular ethnicity decided to use that term, that would not be allowed. And for some reason, there's a slightly different notion of what anti-Semitism is to, versus what racism is. And that's not to decry the racism that other people experience relative to anti-Semitism, because the reality is that living in Britain today, anti-Semitism is not the worst thing to experience. And I say that as a Jew married to a Ghanaian. Um, however, we also have a situation where institutional anti-Semitism in, and its proximity to power is very significant in the UK at the moment. So it's a particular time when we should be trying to look to address this issue, not put our hands up and say we're not that kind of football club. Yeah, so essentially Spurs are washing their hands of this at the moment and saying it's nothing to do with us. And um, what are the Spurs supporters group saying? Are they automatically reactionary saying, oh, no, 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 we, we're allowed to do this because that is our identity? Or is there any thoughtfulness coming from them at all? Um, I would, it's hard to reduce um, a, con a constituency of 50,000, 60,000 people to a particular opinion. 
I think that some people mind, some people don't mind. I think the majority don't mind in my experience. And I would say like the official position is probably the official supporters club body is, is that it's okay. Um, and there are Jews that support Tottenham that think it's okay. I, I, have, I have mates that go to Spurs that think it's okay. Um, certainly, and as I wrote, I wrote a piece for New Statesman about a year or so ago, as a kid, thought it was quite funny. Um, look at all these people who aren't Jewish when you're kind of raised to almost think that the opposite of Jew is non-Jew uh, in, a, in, in lots of different social and cultural ways. So isn't it really funny that these people who are the opposite of Jew are identifying themselves as Jews and we're looking at that and laughing. And having grown up a bit, um, I now see that very differently. But there are Jews that, there are Jews that think it's fine. But you can find Jews that think lots of things are fine. And because you can find people who will stand in opposition to any opinion that you like, but if there's only if there's only a few of them and they have a particular bias, it means they're unlikely to be right. And we see that now in politics, where you have accusations against the Labour Party, and then you have Jewish Voice for Labour who are saying, well, actually, this is fine, even though up to 97% of the Jewish community disagree with them. You will always find people to take a particular side, and particularly if they have a particular pre-existing bias. So with Jewish Voice for Labour, they have a particular bias towards Labour and Jeremy Corbyn. With, um, with Spurs, you have people who are Spurs fans, who have self-identified in this way through their lives. They have a particular bias towards identifying in that way, towards Tottenham, towards being a Tottenham supporter. Um, I'm not saying they don't have the right to an opinion, um, as Jews, I'm just saying I disagree with them, and I think they're not in the majority. What would you like to see Spurs do? Like, I mean, has there been enough of a backlash that they're going to reconsider and change their view on this, or is this the type of thing that disappears for a couple of weeks? I that I think I would say that it's too much trouble and it's too much aggravation for them to alienate people whose money they want to take by saying this is wrong, don't do this, and if you do this, and it doesn't even really need an if you do this. I don't expect that from Tottenham, um, but it should be a. The official position is that this is wrong. Here are multitudes of reasons why this is wrong. It's absolutely not your place as non-Jews to say we're going to out us, we're going to identify ourselves as as Jews and use, a, use an offensive term, so to do, whatever the reason. But Spurs won't do that because, as I said, like it's, it's aggravation for them politically. They want to have a good relationship with their supporters. I understand that. Uh, their supporters are their supporters. They rely on them. They want their money. Why would they try and alienate so many of them they wouldn't but i think that they would find that it would not be alienating if they did it in a conciliatory way and an honest way and and try to actually not educate people using their own educational powers because that's not their job but there are plenty of things people could read and learn about this and spurs i think do have a responsibility to their community and a social responsibility to the country at large to do that Daniel, how much does this go beyond Spurs as a football club? Because we speak about this there as the Spurs fans reclaiming this term. Is it used as an abusive term towards Spurs fans or towards any other footballing sporting groups? Um, I don't think anyone else really, apart from Spurs, gets that because Spurs were traditionally perceived as the Jewish club. Um, I guess my experience of going to school in North, North London in the 80s and 90s is that that was probably the case. My experience now as uh, someone who lives in North London is a bit older and following football around and following my own club around the country says that Arsenal and Manchester United also have a lot of Jewish supporters, but really who cares? And um, race and identifying as a particular race don't need to have any part in football whatsoever. And it's not just about Jews and not Jews. Uh, there's a song that United supporters sing about Chris Smalling. And one of the lines is, he's big and he's black and he plays at the back. Now, Chris Smalling is not black, he's biracial. But in any event, it doesn't matter. The race of Chris Smalling has nothing to do whatsoever with his ability as a footballer, with who he is as a footballer. And, and using a racial term, whether it's offensive or not, has absolutely no place in a football ground. And I feel like that about every possible racial term. It made me uncomfortable when people sing songs about Mohammed Salah being a Muslim. And because it's significant to his identity, and his identity is none of my business. And I understand even when people are trying to be accepting of those things, but who is it who gets to decide which things are acceptable and which things aren't? And I just think it's just best to leave these things out entirely because they're not significant. All right, let's I mean, move on. Sorry, on. they are extremely significant, but they're not significant in a footballing context. Yeah, no, for sure. I think you've done a great job of explaining that. I want to do 
want to talk about Manchester United tonight because um, I want to play you this first. It's John O'Shea, who's an ambassador for the UEFA Under-17 European Championships. Here he is talking about uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's revolution at Man United. Have a look. Just the, the fact that how he's turned the whole club around so quickly and it's not just obviously more it is important obviously what he's done on the pitch but more so off the pitch also the impact seemingly he's had around the training ground the the whole place at Old Trafford as well the whole place is buzzing again and uh, obviously results have dictated that too and he's been alongside Mick Phelan a, a crucial part of that and obviously Michael Michael Carrick and um, the coaching staff as well have been have been crucial too in that but He's just give a freshness, and he's shown his qualities. Not just people say, "Oh, yeah, he's a he's a nice fella. He's a, he's a, he's a good man." But he's shown his qualities as a coach and as a manager. How he's transformed. It, yeah, they've had good players, but the good player, great players, and but they haven't been performing. He's made them made them perform. They've consistently shown it now the last few weeks. PSG obviously was will be one of the ones that it was a bit of a shall we say a blip. But you have to remember, PSG have been at the forefront of the European games and they've had a right go to do uh, to get success in the Champions League financially as well so there was even though they were missing a couple of players people were making out that it was going to be quite comfortable for United but PSG have a fantastic squad and they were able to cope with it and Oli has a, a big test on his hands to turn that one around, turn that game around in Paris coming up so but as I said even if he doesn't turn that game around I think the job has to be his going forward yeah, um, so that game obviously tomorrow night. Uh, I was giving people the head staggers a little bit earlier when I said it was tonight. But just to, to talk about what Solskjaer has done, one of the things that has also kind of been peppered through this is um, just giving youth its opportunity. There's been a number of players who've come through the setup who have been given the. It's it's small enough minuteage so far, but it's been significant because it, it's it's a throwback to that tradition that Manchester United have always had, and it's also completely different from what would have happened if Mourinho had stayed. Um, I wonder how much of that is actually necessity being the mother of invention and the injury crisis has led to young players coming through or if that turns out that's just what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wants to do. Um, I think that what, what John Eche said there is interesting because it's all, in what you say there about the young players is it just makes everyone happy. It, there's, there's some footage of uh, Jimmy Garner coming on at Palace last week and you can just see how delighted everyone is on the bench for him that he's having that moment. And... Um, and it's just one of those details. Uh, what, what, what O'Shea was saying there was also that the club is a happier place. And I heard an interview with Rio Ferdinand yesterday where he said something similar. He'd been to the training ground and previously a lot of the ex-players had felt not really welcome to do that. And because of the atmosphere that Solskjaer has created, everyone around the club is happier. And there's people who aren't footballers. Um, it's probably, you don't really think about it too much if the people that, give the players lunch are happy and the people with the receptionists are happy and you think yeah whatever but actually I mean we all have places of work and if they're nice pleasant places of work people are happier and people are likely to work better and all these little details um, are relevant to creating a family atmosphere where people are prepared to put the, their bodies on the line and where everyone buys into the same thing and when you have that kind of unity it's a very it's a very powerful thing and so I think to bring it back to the young players, they haven't had a lot of minutes. And yeah, it's true that most of them probably wouldn't have those minutes without an injury crisis. But there definitely is an idea to get as much out of the young players as they can. And I know that the club think that the uh, Garner, Chong, um, Angel Gomez, um, uh, Mason Greenwood could be United players for the rest of their careers. They think that they've got a class 92 standard of young player. Not all of them, but four or five of them that could be good enough to play for United. And that's uh, partly that's the philosophy, the identity of the club, whatever you want to call it. And if you look at it a different way, it saves the Glazers a lot of money. Um, so there is definitely a will to do that. Um, so, but the thing about Solskjaer also is he has all of those elements, but it would be wrong to neglect the footballing element. So against Palace, for example, he manufactured a team that no one would have picked that team, the one that he started with. No one thought he was going to play Diogo Dallo on the right side of a diamond, for example. But he did. They got a result and they got it pretty comfortably. And when when they stopped playing at 2-0 and Palace got a goal, he made a change. He brought um, he put Ashley Young to wing back. He went to 3-5-2, um, brought, made a substitution. And within five minutes, Young was pushed further forward and scored. Um, then against uh, Southampton on Saturday, um, Sanchez got injured. He brought on Dallow 
And within about 10 minutes, United had scored twice and Dallo had been hugely involved in those goals. If Andreas Pereira had given away a goal against Burnley like he did under Mourinho, he'd have been spending the last six weeks in the gulag. But Solskjaer understood that young players make mistakes. Also, he was playing out of position. He hadn't had a lot of football. And so he's found him a more natural position. He's brought him back and he got a golden assist out of him at the weekend. So it's, it's at the moment, he's doing more or less everything right. He's getting the atmosphere right. He's getting the way that he relate, relates to the players right. He's getting the tea, the family team building right. And he's getting most of the tactics right too. Just playing devil's advocate to all that, Daniel, like, is there a chance that, say, if Solskjaer gets a job, that he poisons the well a little bit by spending money? Because, like you've said on the show multiple times, that they do need to spend money to actually get back to a title-challenging level. How many signings do they need, and how can they do that without kind of affecting what is going on at the moment with this positive youth culture? Um, no, I, I, don't think, I, I don't think they will poison the well. I think that, that if he does get the job permanently, then it becomes a slightly different job where actually there's now there's now pressure on you to do well or you'll get sacked. I guess at the moment he doesn't exactly have the pressure of getting sacked, but at the same time, this is the chance of his life. Um, so that, that itself is a lot of pressure. I would say they, in terms of the players they need, I mean, I would I'd buy a midfield player. I think about buying two midfield players, but you're always thinking, and I'm sure he would always be thinking, that you don't want to sign players who go in front of your talented youth players. So... Some people think United could do with a right back. I wouldn't sign a right back because I would have I would I would spend next season alternating between Dallow and Young so that Dallow could go full time next season. I think they'll sign the centre back. I've heard there are very strong rumours, and I guess I've also heard that they do want Jaden Sancho. And they haven't had a right winger for years, so I would guess what you'll see arrive is a centre back, a midfield player, and a winger. And with that, they probably won't be good enough to challenge the Champions League because. It's not just about being having a team in that season. You, oft, you generally see teams building towards winning the Champions League. So seeing it with PSG, the team that they have now looks the one that's best equipped to win the Champions League. But they've been building towards that for a few years. And you add a player here and a player there. United aren't at the tweaking stage. They're at the developing, growing into a team stage. But if they do sign those three players, a centre-back, a midfield player and a winger, and they're the right three players, there's no reason why they shouldn't challenge for the title next season with what they've got. The the ability that we've talked about already of, of Solskjaer to tactically influence games and then to explain afterwards why he did it is is quite a new thing. And it, like it's kind of what you you've seen from many of the younger breed of modern managers who come out and are like quite happy to explain exactly what the changes they made were supposed to do and how it impacted the game. Um, it's not something that we'd seen from Man United really like. I mean, maybe Van Gaal would have talked a little bit about it if he hadn't generally been so defensive um, with Mourinho, unless it had worked. Obviously, everything was um, off the table in terms of what you could talk about. This is also something that seems to have resonated with Man United fans. Um, yeah, I think because what it is, is it's part of a culture of openness. And like, there are no secrets. It's not that complicated a game. I'm going to do more or less this. Like, obviously, he won't tell you what he's about to do before a game. But... Every game is different, and it's about I think like demystifying, not 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 demystifying. It's about creating a kind of open culture where everyone feels relaxed and happy, and people feel relaxed and happy when they can speak freely without secrets and without fear of repercussions. So, if the manager is very open about what he's doing, then it gives you a certain confidence in what he's doing. Because if he doesn't mind talking about how things are and being honest then it means he's confident and he's happy. And that's what you see with Solskjaer, where in every circumstance, he'll always, there'll always be a positive and there'll usually be a challenge as well. So to go back to Jimmy Garner again, when he made his debut, Solskjaer then said, um, well, actually, we think he's old. We think he's good enough. He could be the next Michael Carrick. That's a lot of pressure. But Michael Carrick took over from Roy Keane, took his number 16 shirt, and that's how it is at United. It's always, it's hard. You're always, there's always pressure. And so what he does is he's honest about the situation and he's positive and tells people that they can do it and there'll always be a challenge to go on and do something further and to do something more. And I think that's what he does when he talks about how, how United approach the games. The approach to games, I look to win them. There might be a plan after the game. So this is what the plan is and this is what we're going to go and do next. And it's just that level of com comfort in what he's doing, confidence in what he's doing and a relaxation that is, that is contagious. 
And um, when people go out on the pitch, if they know that they can go and perform and there'll be no recriminations, but they will be answerable for their mistakes, that is the best working environment that you could want. Yeah, so it's a great working environment. The, the issue for, I mean, we haven't really talked this much about, um, before Mourinho left, we were having conversations about the club is actually run so badly that it's going to be very difficult for anybody to come in and fix the issues. And that hierarchy is still entirely in place. So what is it that Solskjaer is going to be able to do to counteract the fact that he still works with the, the powers that be at Manchester United and will be consistently working with the powers that be that have successively failed the end of Ferguson, the Moyes era, Van Gaal and uh, Mourinho? Well, I think the most important thing is getting the most out of what he has means that what he needs to do to it is less, like the team requires, doesn't require the major surgery that people might have thought it required because actually he's showing its potential. This is what it can do. He can't go and negotiate transfer deals. That is up to Woodward. And he can't, he can't make money available that the Glazers won't give him. What he can do is be definitive in the players he identifies. I don't think that Mourinho was that. Like, apparently Mourinho changed his mind a lot. And literally, just before he signed the Kaku, like, Murata was doing everything but holding the scarf above his head. And then Mourinho changed his mind and went for the Kaku. I don't. So I think he'll be definitive in who he wants. And But, I mean, the way it work, tends to work is he'll say, this is my top choice for this position. Here are two others. And so he'll... I think that being that certainty in what he wants is, will be really important. The rest of the stuff, he can't do it, but it's, you trust him to make the best of whatever he ends up with and not spend the time bitching and sniping about what he doesn't have. And I think that was really what brought Mourinho down in the end, as much as the, much as the crap football, was a product of the crap attitude. And you won't get that from Solskjaer. So he can't, he can't force the Glazers to stop leading the club dry. He can't get Woodward to know about football or to be good at negotiating a deal, but all the other elements are things that are in his gift and in his control. And so far, he's showing that he's got the ability to do that, but things will get harder because I wouldn't say he's been lucky so far. don't really believe in luck in football. Usually, most things that happen in football happen because of your skill or the pressure you put your opponent under or errors that the opponent makes. But there are some results that if the balance of play or the balance of chances were to go that way, United might be on the other end of that. But the more he works with the players, the more he has, a, the, the, if he has a pre-season with them to get them fitter, there'll be fewer injuries and they'll be able to run harder. And he'll, if he buys the right players to strengthen, then you would expect United to create more chances and concede fewer chances. So it does, it does look really good. I mean, it seems ridiculous to be saying this, um, but at the same time, anyone who's sort of spent a bit of time watching him, even when he was at Mould, watching him talk about football, watching him talk about football when he was at United, could see that he is a special person. And he's not one of those people who no one has a bad word to say about. He's one of those people who people only have good things to say about. And you don't come across people like that very often in your life. And he is, he is that. He's a brilliant communicator. He clearly has a tactical brain. He's collaborative. He speaks to the people that are around him and takes advice from people that he trusts who seem to be giving him good advice. And, and he's also quite hard. Um, people talk about the fact that he's nice, he makes people happy. But you can see that like, the interview he gave to Alan Shearer after you know, I beat Chelsea in the cup. And he was talking about winning the cup himself as a player. And he said, yeah, I won it. I was lucky enough to win it in 99. I think you played in that one, Alan, didn't you? And um, just like that, those kind of snide little remarks that work in the environment of a football, of a sport, of any kind of dressing room, where people know that if you, if you get wide, he'll cut you down. And Alan Shearer hadn't even got wide, and he cut him down anyway, just for the fun of it. Um, so he's not just, he's not a pushover. And I think people know that as well. You don't have the career that he had, particularly all that time spent on the subs bench and then coming on at the vinegar strokes. You don't, get, you, don't, you don't succeed in those circumstances by being a pussy. And he's not a pussy. And I think that sometimes it's just right man, right place, right time. And in just the same way that he failed at Cardiff, amazingly trying to teach a bunch of carpenters, blacksmiths and boastmen how to play football, rather than just hoof it up, which is what Malky Mackay was doing, didn't work. But if you sent Pep Guardiola to Cardiff, would he have been a success there? Not necessarily, but if you give him 
the greatest midfielder of all time, one of the greatest footballers of all time, and a club that has a particular way of doing things with which he is familiar, and players who respect him on that basis, you get the greatest football club of all time, probably the greatest football team of all time. And Solskjaer is simply like that. He's got great attacking players who he knows how to talk to. He understands how to talk to the supporters. I mean, every interview he gives is a minor classic. It's like microdosing MDMA. That it just makes you feel not just good about football, good about yourself, good about Manchester United, good about the world. I mean, it's ludicrous, really. I'm a 40-year-old man saying this, but it's true. And sometimes things just come together and it looks like that is what is happening here. But of course, it could all go wrong at some point. That positivity has to be like such a huge, uh, like a huge thing for him in terms of putting forward uh, his candidacy for this role. Because you look at some of the other candidates for this, Daniel, and like Maurizio Pochettino seems to have just got into a spiral of negativity over the, the last week. Massimiliano Allegri doesn't seem like the most cheery guy in the world either. Like, is this going to be the thing that gets him the job? Just the fact that people are happy? Uh, no, I think it's important. But people are happy because results are good, mm. and results are good because people are happy. It's just a, it's a nice little virtuous circle, really. If, he, if everyone was happy and United were winning a few and losing a few, he would not be getting this job. He's getting the job because the results are unarguable. Even now, if they went and got Pochettino, you would say, well, you would be able to understand why they did that, because Pochettino has more of a track record. But given how much Pochettino would cost... And given what Solskjaer would cost, that is a very significant element for the Glazers to consider. But you just can't argue with what Solskjaer's done on the pitch. It's not been good. It's not been really good. I mean, it's been, it's been spectacular. And um, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't so early in the morning, I would have prefixed that with several expletives. It's, it's, been, it's been spectacular. And provided it continues like that, if United do what they need to do from here, it seems unlikely that they'll win as many games as they have. But if they keep winning, they don't collapse and finish fourth, then it will be impossible for them to give the job to anyone else because there will be more evidence that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is the right man for Manchester United than Maurizio Pochettino is because he would have done the job and proved his ability to do the job, which Pochettino can't do. So um, it's very hard to see them giving the job to anyone else, but it's not just about making people feel happy. Making people feel happy is a constituent part of getting results, I think. And the more results you get, the happier people get. Daniel, great stuff. Thanks a million. I'll see you again. Daniel Harris giving us some thoughts this morning on a couple of big stories of the day. Microdosing MDMA. Good description. Um, yeah, it's, uh, like it's, it's mad actually, kind of, since it's become... I'm not sure, is it apparent or has it just become highly likely that Poch or that uh, Solskjaer is going to get this job? I would say inevitable now. Yeah, it's, it's edging closer that way, which is sort of weird because after the Paris Saint-Germain defeat in the first leg, it did seem that he had taken, uh, that he had taken a, a bit of a stumble with regards to getting this job. Like, and you look at the back pages this morning, and as I mentioned there, Pochettino hits out at massive disadvantage for Spurs. He's probably right, but like, the tone of Pochettino is, always, is uh, suddenly looking different to the tone of Solskjaer, and I would have always kind of thought that Pochettino would have been quite an amicable guy, kind of friendly in front of the microphone, smiling, a couple of results can obviously change that. Bit of a killer, no? Pochettino? A killer behind, uh, behind it all. Yeah, but you know that, so there was never any doubt. Is there an element of something, a kind of a light version of that with Solskjaer? Like, I think Daniel touched on it there, that obviously he's uh, he, uh, out in front of the public, he's a very happy, cheerful guy. And I'm sure he, that is the way he is as, a, as an actual human being. But in terms of that ruthlessness, he hasn't got to where he is now and like I know it's only a couple of months into the job without having that streak of ruthlessness um, it, I think there's a difference between ruthlessness and negativity and I think Pochettino kind of is he starting to give echoes of a bit of negativity over the past week or so well Probably so you if you're say. Pochettino what are you doing right now well, you, are, you are, are cementing you the job you, absolutely not it's gone you know it's gone it went three weeks ago mm -hmm. so now you're rebuilding your trust with the Spurs fans and with that dressing room making sure that it was never an option. I was never leaving. What are you talking about? I, my agent had no contact. I did no interview. I was never joining Man United. I'm, I am wedded to Spurs. We're going to take Spurs from Wembley. We're going to take them home. And we're going to ride to glory together. Although maybe I'm going to sell Harry Kane. Get somebody else. I like the way people have spoken about the Spurs team as if getting a new stadium is like signing Cristiano Ronaldo. It's like you're moving into a new stadium. they are gone home. They are gone home. I mean... They were, they were crap at Wembley for like three years and then eventually they got okay at it and 
You wouldn't say it's a fortress, would you? No, I wouldn't, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to have as huge an impact as some people think. There's actual football players that probably need to be added to the squad. Yeah, do, totally. Maybe they will now, though, because they're not spending money. They're making money every time they play games. So uh, Dublin's Brian Howard spoke to us yesterday ahead of the AIB's Future Sparks Festival, which takes place later on this month. Here he is talking with Owen. Have a look. Okay, so as you can see, I'm with Dublin GA's Brian Howard. How are you, Brian? I'm all good. Thank you very much. So you're here today to launch uh, the AIB Future Sparks Festival, which is on in the RDS in the 14th of March. So some of uh, the leading figures from Irish technology, social innovation, music, sport and business, they're going to be speaking at the event, which is now in its second year with over 7,500 senior level students descending upon the RDS for an event which will bring together business leaders and young entrepreneurs to inspire students and show them the power of their potential. Uh, when it comes to young entrepreneurs, when it comes to business leaders, you're in a business degree yourself, I think, Brian? Yeah, I'm in my third year of a business studies degree in, in DIT. And I'm, I'm actually very excited to, to meet some of the future entrepreneurs of the future. And it's a great way to learn from them. And I'm not too much older than them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a good way to, to know and get their insights into what they want to do. And, and maybe I could learn from them as much as they can learn from me. Is there a particular area of business you're actually interested in? Or is it just at the moment keeping your feet down and surveying everything at, at your disposal? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of keeping all my options open, but at the moment I'm sort of focusing towards the marketing uh, aspect of business, which I don't know where that would bring me, but um, yeah, my course now, it, it branches off into in different things if you want it, so I think I'll be going down the, the marketing route, but who knows. Mm. Yeah, the world's your oyster, I yeah, guess. Exactly. I'm sure one of the things that people are going to be asking you about is uh, a lot of kids here, and like one of the, the, the big questions is when you, when you finish up school, the work-life balance or the study-life balance as it, as it is for a lot of Leaving Cert students, which is obviously something you've had to deal with yourself throughout your Dublin career, throughout your school days. Uh, is there anything that, that first comes off your mind into the importance of having something like football on the side when you're studying? Yeah, I know I put huge focus on trying to maintain both of them because I know some people, they, some students, they neglect the, the sporting aspect or whether it's just exercise in general, just getting out and, and clearing the head. And I use it as a great way of releasing stress and I focus set aside whether it was two hours a night or, or whatever it was to, to just release it a couple of times a week just to release all the stress and, and focus. And when I'm down there, I just didn't think about school, didn't think about exams. So now I was, I was playing minor when I was playing, doing my leaving search. Mm. So it, it was difficult and it was challenging but but the reward at the end just to, to go down with your friends and then you can get back clear the head for the, for the next day and, and get to bed early yeah for sure and can you talk to us a little bit about what your day at the moment is your typical day i know you're obviously in third level so every day is kind of different when it comes to lectures so say when you're in college on a, on a tuesday or on a wednesday is, is it strenuous is, is it high octane stuff and then trying to get to training straight away after college there's there's obviously a bit of balance that you have to do and it is difficult to get I know I'm studying DIT, so to get out to where we're training, it is difficult when it's rush hour traffic. But um, now it's obviously when you wake up in the morning, you, you have to go in early, you do your exams, and there is breaks. College, it's it's a nice time of your life. I well, from my experience, that there is there is gaps, and you can you can fit in your food, you can fit in socialising, true true lectures, because it's not too strenuous at the moment. But uh, maybe in fourth year it might, might change. But at the moment, it's it's not too strenuous, and I sort of I could have a bit of leeway leaving lectures and just catching up, like asking a few of the lads or or the girls in the course just to pass on the notes. So that, that's what I do. <laughs> Uh, I, w I want to talk a little bit about uh, your hopes for this year, but we should touch on 2018. It wasn't a bad year for you, Brian, was it? Like at the start of the year, if you were told that you were going to become uh, a, a starter consistently for Dublin and an all-star and an all-Ireland winner, you probably would have taken that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, last year was an amazing uh, achievement for me. At the start of the year, when I set out, so I just wanted to say to my parents, sat them down at the start of the year and friends and, and just said, I'd love to get a bit more game time than the previous year because I didn't get too much and then just kept rolling and rolling and I became more confident and when Jim gave me the, the start against Kildare in the first game from then on I just became more confident and kept developing and getting better and better and then it just tumbled away from me then <laughs> and like how big a thing was that for you that that confidence because obviously one of the things that was played out quite a bit in the media was two great young players last year yourself and David Clifford and it seemed the two of you kind of thrived under the pressure and under the spotlight but that obviously gave you a lot of confidence that under that spotlight you were playing so well yeah um, obviously David Clifford a phenomenal player and 
I know he's going to be a great addition when he comes back in with Kerry, but but no, there was no external pressures. I knew what I had to do, and at the end of the day, all those the All Stars and awards they're they're obviously nice to get, but it's not the main focus. Um, our focus as a team was to get get the Sam Maguire again and get our hands on it, and thankfully we did that. How big a help was it having Brian Fenton there? Oh, uh, Brian, he's from day one. I've always said it. He's he's a great role model of mine. He he was helping me from day one, bringing me to train and telling me how to go about it, how to what's right and what's wrong, how to go about things. So having him there was a great help, and just the whole culture of the team. It's is very welcoming. I know my first session when I went in. From then on, I knew I was just one part of the team because they were coming over. They were giving me advice. They were welcoming me in and, and having to crack from day one. So that helped a lot. And then it's not a coincidence that a lot of new lads come up, have developed on to be great players because because the transition from whether it's your club coming in, it, it's not too difficult because it's just such a great bunch of lads. It's uh, Brian Howard um, speaking with you yesterday, having the crack. Yeah, he's... Uh Enjoying his football, I dare say, at the moment, which is uh, is it possible? I certainly wouldn't be one of those people who'd be able to enjoy being somebody going for five in a row. Uh, the pressure would definitely grind me down, but it seems this particular set of Dublin players are well suited to it. Uh, really, you you wouldn't like to be an elite athlete at the beak of your power is about to make history. Well, maybe you, if you, I, wouldn't, if you wouldn't find that an enjoyable thing. Maybe really? if I was That's good quite, to play quite for the Dublin, admission. The, the confidence would come with that as well. Uh, okay, let's bring you part two, the second half of our chat here with Brian Howard. Have a look. It's an interesting enough sporting environment as well that you come from. I think with so many of the Dublin players, there's different sports that people feed into, like Michael Darren McCauley and his basketball, Brian and his uh, swimming sure, past, yeah. and like Rohini as a whole. Like it's a great year for Rohini footballers, but like Nick Clausey in the in the marathon last year and all that. It's been a great little sporting environment. Was it always GAA for you? Um, no, uh, I went to St. Fenton's High School out in Sutton and it was a very sporty school. There was a lot of sports. I played soccer, basketball, rugby. Um, loads of different st- sports. So, but I always, my heart always l- was in the in the Gaelic. You know, I played a lot of rugby um, during school, and I went on to play a bit more. But but now my heart was always in in the the rub- in the Gaelic. But there there is like there's so much you can learn from rugby, and um, physicality, and then obviously the basketball, the hand eye coordination, the movement, and that's developed me to be the player I am today. What position did you play in rugby? I was second centre. Right. Okay. Uh, Thirteen. Yeah. Bit of a Brian O'Driscoll. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not as good as him, though. <laughs> you talk about like some of the things that you can learn from other sports. And it was, it was funny, I was actually going to ask you about that because we saw Johnny Cooper in the off-season uh, going with Leinster Rugby and he went with Saracens for a while as well just to pick up a few things from them. Ha- has there been any of that uh, on your own individual level in terms of self-improvement? Because I know you always have like a month or two just to yourself before you go back in with the dubs to actually focus on yourself and, and self-improvement. Yeah, um, but I, I didn't focus really on any other sports really sure. other than just fitness. I know my school was big into the athletics and, and other than that, there wasn't really much that I picked up on um, on the off season. I just sort of just went after my preparation in, in terms of I knew it was, it's going to be a tough year ahead as as a scene with the league, so competitive. So I sort of just getting into the right mindset of what's going to be challenging us this year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like it's it's mad when you think about Rohini footballers. Is there a gene that makes you so good at high fielding, or is there is there is there something in particular? Because like people talk about your catch in whatever the seventy fourth minute against Tyrone last year, kind of reminiscent of Brian Fenton. A lot of what he does is reminiscent of Kieran Whelan. Yeah, no, I, I know I've heard that before. There must be something in the water yeah. in Rohini, but no, I think just the, the juveniles in in Rohini is is well well established and, and people put a lot of focus on that right down from the Oga under fives all the way up there's there's a great support and background I know new chairman now Colin Codd he's he sort of has stuff in place and, and for the likes of the senior members going down in any club uh, the effect that a senior member has on the younger kids whether it's coming down watching a game of football or watching them play or taking a training session it's it's infectious for the team and and it is, it's to hear a new voice. I know Rohini are trying to, trying to bring it in, get, getting just the interaction between different levels more powerful. And it's something that hopefully, because I know when I was young, having Kieran Whelan come down, it was magical for me to just hear a new voice and someone that's been through it all and he's won medals and, and have lost some big games. But hearing him and coming down, sharing his knowledge and it's really developed the club. And I know 
myself and Brian and like, like Sean McMahon who have been around the Dublin squad are trying to develop that that interaction between juveniles and, and seniors in the club. Yeah, it's great. It's it's a remarkable attitude to have to not get totally caught up in what you're doing and to actually think about your legacy, which is ultimately what the club going to look like after I finish playing. Yeah, yeah because if it wasn't for Rohini, where I started off, we wouldn't be anywhere really. Um, so there is huge credit. And I know that myself and Brian and as all the other lads on the team love going back to playing with the club because there's a different atmosphere. I know... When the dumb team is great and all, but when you come back to the club, the lads that you've literally grown up with, you hang around with, mm. the friends they've been through, all sorts of stuff with, not on the field and off the field, it is, it's very good to go back and, and be able to play games with them. I know we would like to play probably a bit more games with Rahini, but, but the way it falls, we just don't get the opportunity. But, but when you do go back for a championship, it's a great, a great time of the year. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I was going to ask you about playing more games. I know we've got a, an off week in the National Football League this weekend. How is the body feeling? I know you're playing Sigerson Cup this year. You did play a couple of Sigerson Cup games this year. A bit of an extra workload. Did you feel the extra workload? Um, no, I haven't felt it because, Obviously, I'm I'm young now, and I just want to keep playing playing matches. But now the the body feels great. It's brand new at the moment, so um, yeah. Just there's, there's obviously a lot of games coming up, and and I've gone past. But Sigerson, it was it was a tough. It's a great competition. And it's a tough. Uh, tough competition. So there is demands in that regard. But when you're going back to Dublin, they they don't expect you to be be training maybe every night when, when you're playing a game. Obviously, they wouldn't expect you to play the night before if you had a Sigerson game the next day. So it is managed, but uh, yeah, it, it is tough, but, but now I feel brand new. Yeah, got, like the, the reason why I asked, obviously, was like whatever it was 12, 13 months ago at this stage, you decided to put all your eggs into the Dublin basket, which didn't turn out too badly. Yeah. It, it always just seems that it's such a great competition, but ultimately there's just a little bit too much going on for young footballers at that time. Is, is that something you'd agree with, or do you think the calendar is actually fine? Um... I think the calendar is grand at the moment and it seems to have worked the likes of Darren Gavin who who had it, and Kane O'Connor who have had tremendous performances with UCD and they've came straight in and, and started yesterday against Roscommon but um, no I think if you like because it's such a high quality competition and you're playing against the best players all over the country that are still in college um, I think it is a great way to, to get a foothold into yourself in terms of you can build confidence from playing Sigerson and then if I know Jim, if you're playing well, he'll, he'll give you the opportunity. So if you come off the back of a good Sigerson campaign, you'll, you'll get the opportunity with inter-county level. Final question then, Brian. What's your best position? Um, I'll take anywhere I'm given, but <laughs> I know I, I like anywhere around the middle eight. So just w- once I'm playing, I'm happy. Yeah, that's vague enough to get you a starting jersey for the yeah. thing. <laughs> Brian Howard, great to catch up. Thank you very Thank much. You. What is his best position? Darren? Anywhere around the middle third, is that what he said? Yeah, around the middle eight. Middle eight, yeah, we'll give him that. What do you think? I think he's got pace, he's really quick. I'd have him in the half forward line personally. Yeah, he's kind of right half forward, left half forward. Yeah, it's Paul Flynn. Well, Paul Flynn's like an all time great. Uh, like Paul Flynn position. Um, kind of dropping back as a third midfielder. The thing is. <laughs> Like the chances are now, the way Dublin are looking this year, is you could have a midfield of Brian Fenton and Darren Gavin, James McCarthy is wing back, Brian Howard is wing forward. You know, if Stephen Cluxon wants to puck the ball long, he could probably go along with those four people on the pitch. Yeah. See, I'm not sure I'd have Fenton and Gavin in the team. I think they're two very similar. I don't think I'd accommodate both of them. I'd have definitely have Fenton. I think Gavin's a great guy to bring on from the bench. And I always thought Keno Sullivan was probably our best midfielder. Better than Fenton? No, like best midfield pairing Fenton, right, okay. is, Fenton is the undisputed best midfielder in that team but I think yeah, the bit of the yin and the yang they complement each other I don't is, think you have two Brian Fentons in the same team is, um, has Johnny Cooper's game changed so far this year just almost by in necessity as well just seems to be on the ball a bit more anytime certainly starting plays more often than you would have seen in the past he's moving around the backs quite a lot I think he's played centre half back and cornerback so far this season so he's, he's getting a lot of game time in different places I don't know of what his best position is I think he he offers a lot going forward um, he does have a propensity to play on the edge and could he be the got sweeper though quite a lot <coughs> the last day I thought he coughed up a few cheap fouls um, he could definitely act as a sweeper yeah because yeah. Uh, I mean one of the weaknesses is that um, if the traditional sweeper is injured as he has been for a period of time um, although he's played, as we know, in started every All Ireland final, um, 
who's his replacement? Like, who's his, who is the... I would think that Cooper's distribution is pretty good, but I wouldn't say it's as good as you'd like for a sweeper. I think he is really good at starting plays and attack, but I think he's just a better defender than he is starting those attacks. So I probably would have him in a more traditional defensive role, be it cornerback or wingback or centre half back. I don't think he has the And who is the, the sweeper then if Gillis injured? It's a good question. It's a good question. Who would be the best man to, to fulfil that role in terms of the ability to pick out a passes and, and start attacks? I'm not too sure. All right. What have you got for us today? Yeah, Shamrock Rovers are the team to catch this morning at the top of the table in the SSC Air Trisky League. The Hoops have won three, lost one and drawn one of their first five games. Last night's 3-0 win over Finn Harps saw them overtake bows on goal difference. Goals from Roberto Lopez, Dylan Watson, Aaron Green had the game over by half time to make matters worse for Harps. Gareth Harkin was stretchered off and manager Ollie Horgan was sent off. The reason why these tweets uh, might explain why. Dave Donnelly interviewed the Harps manager after the game who said one of the reasons he was given his marching orders while a substitution was being made in the game was apparently because he referred to the referee's name Os Gwelga. The referee Ben Connolly would be Ben Canela or Ben O'Connell. Um, and apparently that was one of the reasons that Ollie Horgan was given for uh, being sent to the stands for the rest of the game. Best league in the world. This is Hashtag class. greatest league in the world. Mauricio Pochettino has warned his Tottenham players not to underestimate Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League. Later, Spurs beat the Germans 3-0 in the first leg of their last 16 tie at Wembley three weeks ago, but they failed to win a game since then. Kickoff in Germany at 8 o'clock. At the same time, Ajax take on champions Real Madrid in Spain. The Dutch side are aiming to overcome a 2-1 deficit from the first leg. There will be new rules affecting penalties coming into force from next season if a spot kick is saved or if it hits the post there will be no rebounds and a goal kick will instead be awarded. Another new law will see the goalkeeper only required to keep one foot on the line for a penalty. Elsewhere players will no longer have to leave the field via the halfway line for substitutions. That's in an attempt to cut out time wasting. There have been mixed reaction to the International Football Association's board's plans for the game. Former professional footballer Paul Merson is not a fan. Who are they? Who are they? Who, who, who is IFAB? Who is it? I mean, the rules, I, I mean, I've read all of them. They, they're just, some of them are bordering on stupid. stupid. Why, what? So as soon as you have a penalty, everybody just goes and does what they want. I mean, it's rubbish. What? That's the whole idea. That's the buzz. You know, the goalie saves it and then who gets the rebound? You know, as a centre half, you know, Curtis is on the, on the edge of the box and I'm on the edge of the box. Who's going to get there first? Who's going to take that gamble? It's not like people are getting injured and it, it constantly yeah. people are getting injured and you think, right, well, let's just stop this now. People are going to get hurt. Uh, no, I, I don't get it. Or, of course, if you're Jan Vertonghen, you could just you know, stand inside the penalty box when a penalty's being taken and uh, get there to the, to the rebound before everybody else. Not better. Hmm? He not doesn't better. get it, on. He's not happy. Yeah, he's, he's not happy. I, I think they actually make a lot of sense. The thing is, actually, instructing the player that he leaves the, the field over that way it could be a difficult task. But also, like, is you don't, it not... You want to get rid of rebounds? Like, does it not diminish the value of a penalty save? No, I don't think. I think it uh, increases the excitement. Mm. Because I, can see, I, can see why, I can see why they've come up with this. That you save a penalty and you still concede a goal. It's like a penalty save should be kind of, that's that moment stopped right there. You've saved your team uh, for sure. There's 100% chance now, once you made that save, that you're not going to concede from this particular juncture. I can see why they've done it. I can also see Paul Merson, the buzz he gets from you know, a goal match scramble after a penalty. I mean, the keeper wins, but the fans lose, and anyone watching the game loses. France have kept faith with the same 15 for the Six Nations showdown with Ireland. Head coach Jacques Brunel has gone with an unchanged team and match day 23 for the weekend's trip to Dublin after defeats to Wales and England in the opening two rounds of the Six Nations. They defeated Scotland 27-10 last time out. He has retained the young halfback partnership of Romain Entomac and Antoine Dupont, while Guillaume Girardo captains the team. Oh, it's a good team. That's a very good French team. Take it back up first, there. Go back up. So we were kind of just saying, uh, Quinny was just saying enough, they can get Fico in the team. Um, I mean, still not good enough to beat us, right? We, this is the bit where we get all cocky about, like, you know, just automatically winning a game against France. Who get we, used to being class, Jair, is that what Owen's line was? Got, what was your line? No, get used to being superior. Get used to being superior. 
comes back to bite you. The Georgia Rugby CEO has blasted World Rugby's proposed Global League. Goshes Fanidzi says it's crucial that the Tier 2 nations are included in the vision for the future of the game. He says the competition is senseless without some form of promotion relegation in the new vaunted World League. On Twitter, in a video statement, he says, I will say that all those who are fond of rugby and who share rugby values cannot accept the outlook which recently leaked. It is probably a couple of snub-nosed retrograde officials who cannot see further than their own noses. In Gaelic games, Philly McMahon is set to make. Is that really, what he said, or is that like just a, oh, the translation? A weird Google Translate that you can kind of. Well, you no, know, they, they, they that man seems the very angry. They put up they? the captions Themselves. on the video, so right. he's speaking in oh, his language. So he's calling World Rugby snubnose and then asking them to, like, help him out. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a brave move. Yeah. it's an interesting negotiating tactic. Let's see how that works. All anger. Billy McMahon set to make a return to action for Dublin in the coming weeks. The Ballymun defender broke his hand boxing before Christmas. The 31-year-old returned to club action and featured in Ballymun Kickham's Dublin AFL win over Thomas Davis last week. He broke his third metacarpal bone sparring in the off-season to keep up his fitness, but says the extended break actually has benefited his fitness and hopes to be in a, in a position to be available to face Tyrone in Dublin's next Allianz League outing. Now... The Westmeath manager, Sean Finnegan, believes the venue for their recent Little National Football League demeaned the competition. He's told Midlands Radio that the facilities on offer for players in the Division 1 meeting with Dublin in St. Clair's and DCU were unacceptable. The pitch does not have dugouts or shelter for subs, while the dressing room they were assigned was too small to fit the entire panel in. When, contact, when contacted this morning by Off the Ball, the Dublin County Board had no comment to make about fixing the game there. Here's what the Westmeath manager, Sean Finnegan, had to say. When we arrived, we find that the pitch had no uh, dugouts, uh, no shelter, no stand. Uh, you had to cross a pitch to get to it. And uh, there, was a, there was a nice crowd of people uh, travelled up from Westmead for it. And uh, there was people standing on the side of a pitch yesterday with umbrellas and children. And it was, it was quite miserable, to say the least. You know, Dublin isn't short of those top-class facilities. We were only five minutes away from the likes of Parnell Park. We drove by the spectacular um, settings of Abbottstown, which has state-of-the-art facilities. And, uh, like, we had, we didn't have dressing rooms yesterday. We had changing rooms. These rooms that, you know, individuals use for... Uh, we had to have three of them. And even with three of them, there was... They fit about eight to ten people. It was, it was totally, totally um, uh, basic stuff. And um, if the Westmeath men were going to play in Dublin, the All-Ireland Champions, if it wasn't in Crow Park, it would be in Parnell Park. And, you know, these girls have earned the right to play in Division 1. And this was the biggest game of the year uh, to be playing the All-Ireland Champions. It's a fantastic um, occasion. And it was... I felt it was demeaned. Yeah, I can uh, see the case he's making. Thanks to Darren for giving us the sports news. Now, let's move on because um, Mark English was on the show last night. He spoke to us after a pretty dramatic weekend which saw him secure a bronze in the 800 metre final at the Indoor European Championships. Have a look. I was sure someone was going to pass me on that last 50 metres. Right. Uh, I thought it would be Tuca or Garcia because Garcia looked really good in the heats and uh, he won his Spanish Championships. He actually beat the winner of my race in the, in the Spanish Championships. So... Um, I was expecting one of them to come up on my outside, but thankfully none of them did. Mm. Uh, you're just the third Irish athlete to win multiple medals in the 49-year history of this event. David Gillick and Derville O'Rourke as well. Uh, it is, you know, a massive achievement. Your third European medal. It's interesting. You say you weren't expecting to be on the podium before the race. Before the race, I would say I, I was probably favoured to get a medal, but when the last lap came around I was <laughs> I was pretty uh, pretty nervous that I would hang on because I just I knew I was out of gears and I had nothing left to give it just was a matter of trying to keep everyone off on the straight until we got to the bends yeah and um, I knew they'd have to run that bit extra then so yeah I was, uh, I was I was lucky to hold on in the end but um, I think sometimes you just get that look all right, um, Tracy Neville is with us this morning. How are you? You're very Hi. welcome. Hi, thank you for inviting me on. You're here for a sports coaching conference. Yeah, with Liberty Support Insurance um, in respect to fee you know looking at the research around how we can get more females into coaching. What do you think? Um, I think it's a real challenge for females. Um, I'm actually fortunate com to come from a sport where I actually have role models within um, netball, um, where I'm constantly growing up, seeing um, you know 
coaches flourish and my icons and ambassadors within that are, um, you know, Lisa Alexander, Jill McIntosh. I think other sports really face that challenge, particularly when there's a male equivalent. Um, and I feel that there's a lot of barriers um, of women actually breaking into um, sports where there is a male and female equivalent. Yeah, I mean, so was netball always your sport as a kid? Yeah, um, no, actually, I played a diverse sport. I actually started out in football, and I was probably guided away from football because football, and um, women's football, wasn't very strong then, um, and they deemed it as a male um, male sport. So I remember at school saying that they they wouldn't mix the genders, and obviously they wouldn't let me play football. But I obviously played from a wide diverse. I played hockey, um, did athletics, did rounders. Um, so yeah, I come from a diverse that, but I obviously specialised as I got older. Yeah, because that seems like. Um it's interesting that that's the first thing you talked about was that there's a male and female sport, um, but netball didn't have that, right? Like, yep. So it's, it's, it's easy to find a pathway, but there's a kind of competition and the constant comparison that's going on by the naysayers, essentially, right? Going, oh, this isn't as good as this other sport here. Why is this sport not the same as this? That's, that's one of the barriers that women's sports always have, right? Yeah, definitely. And I always say, you know, we, we talk a lot about women's sport, women's sport, women's sport, and at the end of the day, it is just sport. And I think when you're employing someone for a job, um, you're employing them for their skill set, their expertise, particularly my roles, the leadership, the business management, and there's a lot in, um, encompass this actual particular role. So actually looking at specific gender um, is not the way forward. However, I do feel that females have a lot of barriers in respect to, you know, how do how do we migrate them into it? My mum got coaching because it was by accident. Have we got a support programme where... What did she get it in? Sorry, what was... Um, just by accident. So basically, I was taking a netball team. My coach stopped. She used to watch every week and she ended up taking my taking team netball, on. Taking netball, even though... And was that yeah, her sport? but it was something that she lacked confidence in doing because it was something that she hadn't had any experience of. And I think, I think there is a way that we could migrate females into the sporting world um, through great support programmes, putting a little bit of financial support around it, giving them the confidence and self-belief because I remember when I stepped into this role for the first time and into coaching I lacked a little bit of confidence you know what would the players think of me I questioned my coaching I questioned the ability to go out and you know give my true character and and that was actually I was actually supported by someone one of my great friends in coaching but people are just not as fortunate as me how big is the financial aspect when you talk about financial supports? Because we had Casey Stoney in with us uh, a couple of months ago talking about the idea that you kind of actually need to have a bit of money to do your coaching badges. And ultimately, footballers in the women's game aren't earning enough to actually justify that in a lot of cases, whereas the men have plenty of money to actually go and, and get their coaching badges done. Is that the same in all sports in your view, or is that really just an exclusive football problem? No, I, it's definitely support. I was actually fortunate, again, um, to have mine supported by um, a governing body, but to be able to me to do that, I had to, I had to give back to the region to be able to, for them to fund my sport. And basically, I had to put the money up front and I had to complete my sporting badge before yeah. they actually financially supported that. So, I, again, I was quite fortunate fortunate to be able to do that. However, people are lacking time. So these coaches that are coming through the coaching clubs, they're also working full time. Um, in employment as well. They also have families. Um, so there's a lot of barriers around that. And I think the ideal model would be for them to actually be supported within their own environment. But there just isn't the mentoring or the financial support for the governing bodies to be able to action that, particularly in netball as well. Um, we work off a li very limited budget. Mm. Like I know it, like it'd be keen to actually talk about netball here, but just sorry to talk about football again for a moment. <laughs> yeah. but, like, how far are we actually from a, a place where it's just going to be commonplace for women to be coaching men? Um, I think I think we're a little bit off that. Mm. However, I've seen the way netball's moved in the last two years, just because some of our success. Um, at the, at the big end of the game in the Premier League. Um, I'm obviously being joined by Emma Hayes later and, you know, it will be interesting to see what her comparison is about, you know, there's been talk around her taking over the Chelsea management role because she's doing so well in the in the women's equivalent. Um, but I do think there's a lot of um, stigma around women taking um, the men's game. You've seen it in the refereeing society in women's football. You've seen, you know, the, re um, the women referees have not been able to come through the system as smoothly and there's a lot of um, angst against them, particularly when they make decisions on the pitch and that. I don't think there's particularly good role models through the system to be able to do that. And I, and I don't think it can stop at the top level. I don't think it can start there. I think they have to change the system from the pathway. They have to hit the pathway first. So actually it becomes quite natural to be coached by a woman. It becomes quite natural to be refereed by a woman. I think that's where we have to start um, putting female coaching in. How, does, how do you change the pathways? 
Um, I think the pathways are very easy to change because they're actually run a lot by the governing bodies. Um, so I actually think um, the governing bodies need to take a little bit more action in respect to how they can put a mentoring programme on to be able to start um, I increasing coaching mentoring around both genders. Um, and I don't think enough is being done through that. So basically support women earlier in their yeah. coaching career. I think it has to be so supported through grassroots because not every coach is going to make it and, and that's just an absolute unreal, unrealistic expectation. However, you know, I went out to netball on Sunday to watch my little niece and they were being coached by a dad's netball and um, they were being coached by dads. And that was a that was really nice to see, it's really refreshing. I go out to my nephew's football. It's very rarely I see a female coaching coaching at the grassroots level and why can't that happen? Because we're a skill set. Um, and a lot of women have the, the, the great attributes of a skill set to be able to take a team at any level. And notwithstanding, just to go back to what you said, what, even when you got your job, you still, despite all of your amazing experience and career and qualifications, you still had that, was it a lack of confidence you said, or just a, a, a doubt at the start? Am I right for this? Yeah, definitely. Um, when I come into this job, um, I was supported by Waitamari, who's, who's one of the a guru of netball, and I actually asked my governing body and my PD to actually fly her over and watch me in the setting and, you know, direct my coach and mentor me. Um, you know, a lot of the things that she actually pulled out from me was that I'd lost a little bit of my personality. I'm quite a, a chatty, laughable, and I'd lost a lot of my personality because because I was coaching at such a high level, um, I felt that my my personality and my, my, the person I was had to change and that wasn't actually the case and I think that's where you lack a little bit of confidence. You don't want to, you know, step over the mark but you also have to bring a little bit of yourself and vulnerability to the job as well because that makes you a person yeah. and coaching is all about people and getting a team together and I think that's something that she really instilled in me that never lose your character and the person that you are and I think that is some of the stigmas and lack of belief and confidence that a lot of women um, face. At grassroots level you can see why that would also, like the under sixes or the under eights or the under tens for the football or whatever, or for the rugby, whatever the sport is, that it's hard because like everybody probably feels that. Like you don't, unless you've been in a coaching course, you're not really qualified to coach kids teams. All you're trying to do is to get them in that first period when you're starting out as a coach yourself is do some drills, play a game at the end, don't kill each other. Let yeah. everybody come back next week and we'll have a good time. And I think, uh, yeah, and, and I think it's all about, you know, when I started out coaching, I didn't coach at the top level, and I think that's some of the mistakes that coaches make. I think what you do is you go into an environment where you make mistakes, you know, you're not perfect, you make some mistakes, you learn by them, but actually what you're not doing is you're not being hounded by press, by fans, but I think there's a real stigma around that, that actually you also have a, a massive cohort of influences, which is the parents. The people who stood on the sideline, you you make a mistake and then they're at you and then you lack confidence. If you lose, who are the first people that come at your parents? And I think they're probably the worst critics of, of all the things. And I think that needs to change and about how you do that. I go out to my niece's netball now. They don't even let um, the parents watch. And that is, that's a real cruel for someone like my mum who's followed me all my life. But however, this, you know, what they're creating is an environment that actually is not comfortable for coaches to flourish. Yeah, no, for sure. Do you, um, are you in favour of splitting genders or what age should genders be split playing sport? Um, I, do, I do think um, in actually the playing sense or in coaching? In playing sense. Um, I do think that men have physical attributes that don't marry. Um, I personally wouldn't want um, men involved in netball, although there is mixed netball at the, the participation level, and I think that's a real great sport, but I personally wouldn't want males involved in netball and a mixed team at a national level in my job. And um, the reason for that is they have different physical characteristics. I do believe that we are a female-driven sport, um, and I, I'm really strong on that. Actually, we have, we have a sport that's aesthetically pleasing, that you know, it is, is gender specific. Um, I do believe there should be a male equivalent. However, in the UK, at the moment, we haven't got the funding for that. So I'm actually quite happy for them not to yeah, be, yeah, share yeah. my funding. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do think there's physical... kids grown up though, like it... it yeah, I, I do think the mix. I played with my brothers all the way through my, through my youth. Um, yeah. You know, I played cricket, I played football, I did everything, I went in the goal, I did, I did everything like that. I think there should be a mix of abilities through. I do think there is a separation as obviously, 
uh, maturation happens, I do think there should be a separation. Yeah, but not um, until 12 or 14. Or... Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't separate. I probably, I still do stuff with my brothers now. Um, probably not the physical sense because we're not in good shape as we used to be. But, you know, I think there is, there's, there's characteristics of my brothers that have really supported me from that, um, the male characteristics have really supported me through uh, my playing and my coaching career. How much do you think a mix of sports helped you reach a high level of performance? Same with your brothers as well, having played cricket and all that. Is the cross pollination of sports and actually just applying different skills, does that help you reach a higher skill level? Yeah, we, we did um, a lot of research in, we did a coaching thing on a lot of research in that and it isn't, it, it's, the, the research suggests that you, you obviously should either play a lot of sports or if you look at um, some of the best Brazilian footballers or the Argentinian, they play um, football, but they play it in very different ways. They play it on the streets, they play it competitively, they play it um, one on one, they play all different variations of the sport. And I'm a great believer in that. That you know, one of the, the angst that I have as a coach is if if my kids. If my players are not playing, that causes me problems because actually what do you, you get into sport by playing. So we try and create environments and it, and it becomes probably a little bit more elitist as you get older. But at, this, at the bottom level, go and play local league, go and play on outside, go and play in um, your school, go and play um, one on one, go and play different sports because that is an absolute attribute to, be, to success. However, not everyone's going to make it. But what it'll do is it'll increase your skill set. You're, you're thinking about the same sport in a different way constantly and I guess it is the kind of wide spectrum of your thinking that helps you reach a high level. Yeah, because there's, there's, different, there's different parts of the game that you can actually um, exemplify. You know, you, you know, now in the UK we play for netball, we play a high five, we play a seven aside, um, the, we play little um, two on two games. You know, there's different ways that you can actually work the sport um, to actually bring out a skill set that you need, like either a possession, um, a space run, a one on one. You know, there's different attributes that you can play the game, and game sense is absolutely crucial to being able to push on in a sport. Does, it, does netball suffer from constant comparisons with basketball? Um, it actually doesn't in the UK because I would probably say in the UK, netball is probably. Um, a bigger supported sport right. than basketball. However, we one of the, the challenges we get is we can't get into the Olympics because we haven't got a male equivalent. And also probably some of the big countries like America and in Europe, they actually don't play netball. So it's not seen as a strong sport or a, a hard sport. So that you know is a massive barrier for us getting in the Olympics. What was it that got you into it in the first place? And my mum. And you talk about um, female ambassadors, you know, even my mum now, she plays three times a week. Um, right. She's the only member of our family who can actually um, go out there and still play. <laughs> and has a body that's actually um, able to do that. But, you know, my mum, you know, you, you follow your mum out to a sporting event, you pick up a spur bib, you help out. And, and that's exactly how my nieces are doing now. They go and watch my mum play. Um, they, they pick up a spare bib, they come to me and we do some netball stuff and you know you think about how the growth of sport and the growth of mindset of, of children these days and they need role models and a lot of it starts at home and within their family environments and you know we have a massive project in netball about back to netball and I see so many mums now going back to netball to play that you know it's something where they can go, they can make friends they can um, get some activity. The, the sport actually complements every single person. We have a goal shooter who plays in restricted. We have a centre who likes to run around. So, um, and they take the daughters along with them and they play on comparative courts. So I think that is the way we need to start taking grassroots forward. That is the most important part, isn't it? Is to get, um, to get adults to come and then to be nice when they're there. It's a, it's a good combination. To inspire I, do, I do think a sideline is quite a challenge, and even even I look at now my sidelines just got bigger, um, and I think they're the biggest critics. And you think actually, if a positive role models were being generated from that, would that then create a more comfortable environment for people to take risks? You know, put their put their um, best foot forward and maybe jump in the water rather than just dip their feet in. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you're uh, at the Women in Sport, the Coaching Effect Symposium taking place today, courtesy of Liberty Insurance. And if anybody wants to do any more writing, what's the or any more reading on this? Have you got any good sources for people to? Um, I actually, um, I would. I googled um, a lot of it, and there's a really great New Zealand article. Um, New Zealand. Um, did something on their sport about getting people into um, female coaching into sport. Um, 
they, it was the New Zealand Herald, they did a really okay. good research article on that um, and I think that was quite inspirational and also Female Coaching UK, they've done some really good articles um, on this as well. Okay, so there's research uh, which will be published today from Liberty Insurance which is worth digging out and also Googling as well. Tracy, thanks very much for joining us this morning. We're going to leave you with this this morning, it's the return of the Type 5, uh, Neil Tracy's deep dive into the Irish and French packs looking at Ireland's line out issues and France's front row aggression. We're back tomorrow morning and live across Newstalk and our social channels from 7 this evening. Good luck. You're welcome along to another edition of the Tide 5. We've been on a bit of hiatus for the last couple of months, but Neil Tracy's back. How are you? Yeah, not too bad now. So we're back with a bang, as in we're getting more in-depth and more nerdy about a, a few subjects this week. We're not going to go for the full five. We're going to go for three things. We're going to focus condense on... Condense it. Condense it, exactly. Quality over quantity. Uh, Ireland line out, the French scrum and the Irish scrum are what we're looking at this week. So, so we are kind of looking at the Tide 5. Well, exactly. Not necessarily five things. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. That's exactly how we should have sold this in the yeah. first place. Exactly. Uh, so let's crack into it. We're going to start with the Irish line-out. So you've been noticing a lot of things over the last couple of weeks, and Sean Cronin was one of those people who got criticised quite a lot after the Italy game. Yeah, so obviously hey, everyone knows the Irish line-out didn't really have a particularly good game against Italy. Now, uh, Sean Cronin was in for what everyone, I think, was delighted to see. It was finally his first Six Nations start, and it, it was the season he's been having as well. It was just so disappointing how the day ended up going for him. I think everyone really wanted to have, for him to have a good game that afternoon. But um, on that Sunday, uh, on Off the Ball, we had Mike Roddick in studio watching the game with us. And, you know, he was trying to point out, he was sitting with me and he was pointing out that, you know, all the hooker's always going to get the blame for this sort of thing when the line-out isn't going too well. So basically what I just wanted to do is we had a look basically at where, where they were throwing the ball and we just picked out two examples that on the face of it look very similar. It looks very much just like a ball is overthrown. And we're just going to kind of maybe point out how the slight difference between the two. This first one we're going to show here, this one actually is, it probably is an overthrow from Sean Cronin. There probably just was a little bit too much on it. So we can see there on the picture above, uh, the little black circle at the top, that is the ball. It's kind of just blended in with the sunlight there. You can't really make it out too well, but we have another angle we'll show you in a second. But you can just see there, the ball is just, just over the hand of Peter O'Mahony. And at that point... You can see the red circle below, that's, um, uh, that's, his, that's his lifting pod. He is, they are at absolute full extension there, Oman. He is not going to get any higher into the air at that point. And the ball is just over his hand. It's just too, it's just, essentially, it's just out of reach from. It hasn't gone behind him or it isn't you know, coming too far in front of him. So if the throw is on the money, that should be coming into his hand right there. We'll what, what is on the money, Neil? Is it, is it at the, the very highest point that you can possibly reach? Is it a bit lower down so that you can get full arm movement? Or where is the, the ideal spot? It kind of depends really how much the opposition are actually contesting it. Like if the, if the opposition are contesting it, you probably want it up nice and high mm. so you can actually just get in above them because you're going to be leading the, leading the jump. If it's uncontested, you could probably be taking it in around here, in around, you know, just kind of high chest level. Sure. But uh, we have another shot there of, of the lineup from behind it. There you see it there. And he's, the, he's absolute full extension there. Yeah. Like that is as high as he's going to possibly go. And that ball is just, just about above his fingertips. Now, the next one we're going to show you, this is probably an example of, again, it looks like an overthrow. But there's a slight little difference. And this one is actually probably the fault of, it's probably either Quinn Rue or his lifting pod. It's, it's kind of hard to know. It's... Pretty much the three of those people are going to be the ones that know, uh, know who actually got that one wrong. But we'll just show it here now. So this is Quinn Rue up in the air. And he, he looks like he's at full extension as well. The ball is just above him. But he's leaning back. Mm. So basically he hasn't been able to get quick enough to... He hasn't been able to get up into the air reach enough to reach that throw. He's just gone too late. Or maybe the, just the lift was a little bit too slow. So even though he's at full extension... The ball is behind him at this stage, so he is having to lean back to really try grab it. Mm. And that's actually the um, that is the lineout that you know Ireland lost, and it ended up leading up to one of the Italian scores. And Cronin would have got a lot of blame for that. Mm. But it's just the slight little differences between the two. And the hooker is you know if someone sees a ball flying over the top of a lineout, the hooker is automatically going to get the blame. Now I think a lot of a lot of the time as well on. Uh, last Sunday, where they were placing the throws, they were trying to go towards that that final, that back third of the line out quite a lot. I I was looking through them there. I only picked out I'd say three out of about eighteen line outs that went into probably the first the f the first part of the line out, the first the first third. Most of them were pretty much going. I think I counted about seven that were in that kind of middle third, and another eight then that were pretty much down at the back of the line out. 
And is that um, the way Ireland usually operate? Um, I need I need to probably look through the rest of the rest of the games, but like you know, the I think what they were trying to do pretty much was on a lot of occasions, in particular for I think it was later on in the game for Conor Murray's try, they used that they went to the back of the lineup to set up a mall quite a lot, and basically what that does it it it, it removes you from the touch line by about a further ten yards, so it just means that it's a lot more it's a lot more difficult for the opposition to try edge your mall towards the touch line. And it kind of just puts you in a better field position. Hmm. It's it's really interesting looking at it. Like if you, if you're Sean Cronin in his position and you're being totally selfish, is there a tendency that you just throw the ball a little bit lower? Like ultimately, the higher you go, the more chance you've got of uh, of not getting intercepted or anything like that, or, or it being a turnover. But at least it's hitting your man if you go a little bit lower. Like just being devil's advocate there for a moment. Like that Quinn Rue uh, instance there, it's clearly not as good a lift as it could have been. But at the same time, if Sean Cronin goes lower with the throw, probably would have stuck. Yeah, but at the same time, it's probably what you say. Like, I'm going to just, I don't have an example there on the screen, but just when you brought it up, there was one example when Niall Scannell came onto the pitch then, uh, and it was actually a throw to the front. I think it was on about 65 minutes or so. And that one, I can't remember what, uh, it might have been, is it either Peter O'Mahony, maybe, or Alton Delan? I, I'd need to go back and check it again. But that one was a throw to the front. It probably was a little low down. And it was picked off by one of the Italian players. Right. So that's the danger you're going into with that. Sure. In terms of personnel, then for this Sunday against France, what are you going for? What What is your what, who's your hooker and who's in the second row for you? Hooker, I'd say Rory Best will be coming back in. Uh, Ty Furlong and Keane Healy probably pick themselves at the moment mm. as the first choice front row and second row. If everyone's fit, I would probably be. I'd probably be giving. I'd be giving Ty Byrne a go with James Ryan. I think. Uh, I think Byrne showed himself. When he played that game against uh, against the Ospreys for Munster a couple of weeks back, he does look fully fit now. Yeah, and he had another unbelievable game. Uh, we're talking about lineouts. He's a fantastic lineout operator as well, especially on defensive lineouts. He had that pretty much a match winning steal for Munster in the in the last minute of that game at the the Liberty Stadium a couple of weeks ago. I'd probably be going for him alongside James Ryan there. I think a more apt question maybe for Hooker is how far has Sean Cronin's stock plummeted, if at all, after the Italy game? Um. You know, the speculation over the weekend was that it looks like himself and Sean O'Brien were the two that are probably going to be jettisoned out of the team. Uh, I'd certainly be giving Cronin another chance, at least on the bench this weekend. I think he's shown his form for Leinster this season. has been absolutely incredible. Uh, I think it would be, be pretty harsh to, to bid him after, after just one disappointing game like that. Let's have a look at the French scrum. We are up against uh, the, the French this weekend. What have you noticed from them so far this year? Um, nothing spectacular, really. I think it was kind of hard to tell off the, off the first game because they did change around the team a lot uh, for the second and third matches. But um, I just took one look at uh, Demba Bamba in particular, who uh, is just one of these fantastic young French players they have at the moment coming through. He started there the last couple of games at Tighthead. And I'm just going to pick out here, Just th- this is uh, one of the scrums against Scotland the last day. And looking at that, his form is actually, you can see his head is ever so slightly above his hips. Mm. Now, for a lot of people, that would actually, that is actually like an invitation for a loose head prop to really come in and attack you under the chest. It's probably something that Keane Healy would be looking out for and really wanting to see. Okay. But one thing that I was very impressed with was that Bamba was able to do this. And he just clearly has so much core strength, so much, <clears throat> so much muscle in his neck and strength in his neck. He was never really troubled in any way like that. Alan Dell wasn't a- of Scotland wasn't able to get in under him at any stage to put him under that kind of pressure. So he was able to stay up that little bit high. And I'm just going to show you one, um, one example here. We'll just roll it on to the next scrum. Now, this is just one, uh, one example of a, one dominant French scrum in the first half of that game. So you can see there, that little arrow is Demba Bamba. He's coming in nice and straight. Ball is about to be put into the scrum. And we'll roll it on to the next one. Roll on. There we go. So you can see at this point the scrum has just completely caved in on his side. Mm. What he's done very, very well is he is just absolutely spliced through into the hooker. So he will have he'll be facing this way. He will have the hooker uh, on this side of him. He'll have his loose head prop out here, and he is just driving in like this to try cut across the hooker. And does that bring the loose head closer to the hooker and therefore collapsing that side of the scrum? Yeah, it just kind of drifts things out towards the left a little bit, and it it kind of just negates what the loose head is doing outside of him. The loose head pretty much is trying to keep the tight head out from going into the hooker, if you know what I mean. Mm. He's trying to stop him getting in there, but Bamba just goes in there. And as you can see in that, Dell and the hooker have pretty much just caved into each other. And on the video then, that scrum just rolls around and it's a France penalty. And is there anything Keane Healy and Rory Best can do this Sunday to counteract that? Um, 
Well, I think just on the numbers anyway, and from what I've seen of the Irish scrum over the last couple of years, I, I don't think they'll have trouble. I wouldn't expect them to have trouble. They haven't had trouble with anyone in the last two years at the scrum. Okay. Uh, they haven't been... The one thing I'll say about the Irish scrum is they aren't particularly dominant. They don't, um, they don't absolutely walk over teams on a regular basis. But what they are exceptional at doing is getting the ball back to the base of the scrum and having it there ready to play. It's one thing Greg Feek has done brilliantly. I, um, I went through basically every Ireland game of the last, uh, since the start of the 2017 season. So of the last 163 scrums that Ireland have had on their own feed, they've won 157 of them. Wow. So they've only lost, the, they've only lost, the, lost six scrums in the last two and a half years. They've lost one scrum in the last two and a half Six Nations campaigns. They haven't lost a scrum on their own feed since the third test against Australia last summer. So that's now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games in a row. So you're looking at, it's a 96.91 success rate on, that's their, incredible. Own, on their own scrum. Someone like England, for example, they would have an excellent scrum as well. They're down, down around 91% is what I did for them for the last two years. The only thing I would say about the... Um, about Ireland on opposition ball, they probably don't go after it as much as other teams. Okay, they're a bit safer at the scrum. Yeah, they are, but they're very safe, sure. which is fantastic. If you're retaining the ball 96.91% uh, of the time, you've got a, you've got a proper scrum. Like, for example, they're, they're, taking a, they're, uh, they're turning over probably 10.86% of opposition scrums. That's 15 of the last 138 that they would have faced. Someone like New Zealand, for example, uh, in the last two years they have won back 17.5% of opposition scrums. Right. So they're probably a lot more dominant on opposition ball. Yeah. And we obviously didn't, we didn't concede anything against the head against the All Blacks either. No, we didn't. Uh, like I'm talking, we're talking seven games in a row where Ireland have just six out of six, five out of five, seven out of seven, nine out of nine, three out of three, ten out of ten, and it was only one out of one, I think, against Italy. That's really interesting. Like, it's something you'd expect then from the game against France. Like, if, if it was going to happen, I dare say it would have been against England that this trend would have been booked. Um, not so much. Uh, I think England have a you know they've they've a very good scrum. I think Ireland are probably up there with with anyone at the moment. <coughs> France have given Ireland trouble at times in the last couple, in the last few years. <coughs> Excuse me. It is. Um, I think though, Tyg Furlong probably would have the match for Jefferson Para, the who is probably going to start a loose head for France. Uh, Key and Healy, if he can if he can keep Demba Bamba, Demba Bamba quiet, I think Ireland will. I think they'll, they'll, what they'll focus on doing is just retaining the ball first and foremost. And what's been brilliant about the way Greg Feek has that scrum set up for Ireland is that the channel, the channel that the ball is, is coming through in the scrum is always so clear with Ireland. The amount, the amount of times that, that just from that little strike, it comes straight back down to the number eight's feet or at the, you know, the back of the scrum. Whereas a lot of teams, they're probably not getting as good a strike on the ball and they're trying to walk over it a little bit and that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Whereas with Ireland, it's always just it's just coming so cleanly through that scrum and that is just from absolute meticulous planning down to like down to the inch of where the second row's feet have to be so that they're keeping that channel free for the ball to come through and it's not getting blocked up in the traffic along the way so that is just sheer meticulous planning that they've worked out over the last few years and to just keep that channel perfectly clear it's very interesting is there anything else uh, before we wrap up about the Ireland scrum for this weekend uh, no that's about it I think personnel wise um, you're, what, what sort of team are you expecting I know you've gone through the, the tight five there who are you expecting the back row um, it looks like it's probably a bit early in the week to be calling it I think um, it looks like CJ Stander might be available um, he's been he's been back training I think at the moment um, you know, there was talk about Dan Levy coming back in if he was fit enough. I know he d hasn't got a run out for a long time with Leinster or anything like that. It probably is a lot. It probably is very early to be calling, some, making some of those back row calls. There's um, Reese Rodick had a good outing for Leinster at the weekend. He'd been out injured as well. Uh, I think on back row, it's actually just way too early in the week to be to be trying to call it. Yeah, it probably is. I put you on the spot there. Good stuff, <laughs> Neil. Thanks for that. That's tied five back. What's your Twitter handle? As Neil underscore Tracy. If you've got any questions at all, we'd be delighted to hear any rugby nerd reviews you have. Or abuse. Or abuse. Come I'm, on. I'm sure there's plenty of that to go around as well. Neil Tracy, thank you very much. That's the tight five for this week.